Good afternoon, everybody. It's uh, good to be back in the house of the Lord with you. Um, if you want to follow along with us, I'm uh, going to be looking at three different scriptures today. We'll be in Exodus chapter 12, and from there we will be turning to uh, Hebrews 9, and then finally um, we will be in 1 Peter chapter 1. So Exodus 12, Hebrews 9, 1 Peter chapter 1 is where we will be at today. If we was going to title this message, it would simply be, I still believe in the blood. Before we get started, we want to ask God's blessing on this word. Lord, we come to you, God, and we just want to pray, Lord, that you would place your anointing upon us. Help us, Lord, to give out the word, to rightly divide the word of truth as best as we possibly can. Uh, God, we pray, Lord, for your people to be blessed, to be lifted up. And Lord, we pray most of all that for someone here today that is lost, that God, they would come to you, Lord, by faith in your Son and be saved. We thank you. We ask it all in Jesus' name. And amen. I can remember um, years ago when I was a boy, even before I was saved, how the Brother Mick would stand in the pulpit and he would talk about those who would discount Christianity. They would say that it's a, a religion of blood, that the Bible is a book, of, a book of blood. And that is true. It is. And I still believe in that blood. Uh, it is still by the blood of Jesus that we are saved. And that's what we want to look at here for a little bit today. Um, starting in the 12th chapter in the book of Hebrews, in the 12th verse, uh, this would be the night that the death angel would come. Uh, God told the people in the 12th verse, For I will pass through the land of Egypt this night, and will smite all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast, and against all the gods of Egypt. I will execute judgment. I am the Lord. And the blood shall be for you a token upon the houses where ye are, and when I see the blood, I will pass over you. And the plague shall not be upon you to destroy you when I smite the land of Egypt. And we'll stop reading right there for just a moment. Um, we live in a day where people just don't seem to get it anymore. People don't seem to understand anymore. And what I mean by that is, just as Brother Mick used to say, that the scoffers would come along and they would discount and discredit the blood. We see it in our modern culture today. And I'm sure that we could go back years and years and years ago. And people did not like to hear about the blood. What is it about the blood that would make people not want to hear about it? I think because when you preach about the blood, you you evoke a response within people. There has to be a response. There will either be the accepting of it or there will be the rejection of it. There, there's really no middle road when you go about this. We understand that the Lord Jesus, when he laid down his life on the cross of Calvary, it was the blood that came out of his body that he would offer for the sins of all people. You know, Dad said in the Sunday school lesson today, he said that it doesn't matter what your sin is, you can be forgiven, and that is so very true. And that is true because of the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, in the blood there is life. When the heart stops circulating the blood, life stops. When the blood becomes diseased, life stops. There is life within the blood. Now here in the book of Exodus, we see God getting ready to pronounce judgment. And the story there in Exodus we know is where God wanted Pharaoh to let his people go. And of course he sent Moses to show miracles and to show signs. And Moses did those things and still yet Pharaoh would not let his people go. There was warning after warning. There was sign after sign. There was miracle after miracle. And yet he would not let the people of Israel go. And so now in judgment, 
God is going to smite all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast. And he says he's going to do this against all the gods of Egypt. I will execute judgment. I am the Lord. That goes much deeper than, than perhaps what we think when we just first read over it. As we have talked about in many different messages down throughout the years, God's desire is that man would be fully given over to his creator. That is God's desire. We are meant to have that relationship with him. We are meant to know him in that fashion as our God, as our Lord, as our Savior, and as our friend. And here God is going to execute judgment against those who will not come to him. Now this is... We have talked before in other messages. We've mentioned it before extensively when we did our study in the book of Hebrews a few years ago. How that the Old Testament is a type or a shadow of things that would come. And most definitely, uh, this is one of those types, one of those shadows of things that would one day come to pass. Egypt in the Old Testament represents sin. It represents a life of sin. And of course, God's desire is that all people would come out of that. God wanted Egypt, I believe without question, to humble himself under him, to let his people go and to humble themselves under him. And God would have been, would have no doubt have forgiven them. But they would not do that. Pharaoh would not do that. And so he says, I will execute judgment. I am the Lord. That is not a popular statement to, to preach in our day and time. I will execute judgment. I am the Lord. But it is a statement from the Word of God that is, is still standing true. It's a statement from the Word of God that is not going away. God's desire is to not execute judgment, but He will execute judgment. It must take place because He is God and because we are guilty and we'll talk about that more in just a little bit. And so he told them that I will execute judgment. I am the Lord. God is a very jealous God. And he wants us. He desires us. But there comes a place, there comes a time when God must, must execute judgment. And so he told them to take a lamb and to take that blood and to put it upon the doorposts of the house. And he said in the 13th verse, And the blood shall be to you for a token upon the houses where ye are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you. And the plague shall not be upon you to destroy you when I smite the land of Egypt. You know, God is one day going to smite this world. God is going to one day smite the lost individual, the sinner. The person who has never come to him. That's not fun preaching. And I don't believe that that is the desire of God. As we have talked about many times from the book of 2 Peter, the Lord is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. In the book of Ezekiel, he told Ezekiel, I have no delight in the death of the wicked. That was the words of God there. God's desire is that people would come to Him and know His love for them. But there comes a time when judgment must take place. And here judgment was going to take place in Israel. But for those who believed the message, those who would take that lamb and kill it and place its blood upon the doorposts, why, God says, when I see the blood... I will pass over you. That message is still the same message that applies to every lost individual today. That when we apply the blood, and when God sees the blood, He will pass over us when judgment will happen. And it will happen. It will one day take place. Now, in thinking about all of that, and knowing what the Old Testament teaches, we know that um, the, the Jewish people had sacrifices, God-given sacrifices in the Old Testament. The lambs, the, the, the bulls, the goats, and all of those many things. 
And in our so-called enlightened modern age that we live, we say, what a barbaric act. We who kill children who are alive in the womb say such a thing. Let me throw that out there. But we say, what a barbaric act. And I think people say that today, and this goes back to my statement earlier, is that people just don't get it anymore. You see, when in the Old Testament, when the sacrifice had to be made, and of course those sacrifices never took away the sin of the individual. They were done in faith looking to the time that the Lamb of God would come. Those goats, those bulls, those sheep, those lambs, none of those things took away sin. The, the message that we have referenced so many times where Abraham took Isaac up there and Isaac said, we've got everything but a sacrifice and I, Abraham said, my son, God will provide himself a lamb. Then when they got there and Abraham was about to take his son's life, the angel of the Lord stopped him and the Bible says that Abraham looked and behold a ram caught in the thicket by its horns. And he and Isaac offered that ram that day. But that wasn't what Abraham said would be offered. He told Isaac, my son, God will provide himself a lamb. And that is the exact thing that God did on Mount Calvary's hill. He provided himself a lamb for our forgiveness. Now, in going back to the Old Testament teachings and traditions and sacrifices, a person would have to take that innocent animal, and they would have to kill that innocent animal with their own hand. And take that blood and take that animal to be offered. And I think that was done for a purpose. I think it was done for a purpose because you had to understand that an innocent life had to be taken because I was in the wrong. That was the purpose of it. The, the lambs, the, the goats, the bulls, they did not commit the sin. The people committed the sin. And they had to take that animal's life because of their actions. And that would spark an emotion within the individual. That's the point of it. And that's why the blood will always evoke a response within an individual. Because when we go to Mount Calvary, there we see pure innocence. And his life's blood being poured out upon the cross. Their pure innocence. They're the most innocent man who has ever walked the face of the earth. Guilt free, sin free. The only things that he ever did was heal the sick, raise the dead, give sight to the blind. Teach about the love of God. Teach about how God doesn't want us to be involved in the things that will hurt us, which is sin. And to tear down the religious hierarchy of that day. Those are the things that he did. Innocent and they nailed him to a cross. But that was God's plan all along. I still believe in that blood today. That blood today is still good enough to save every soul on the face of this planet, I believe. Guilt. Our guilt was upon him. And his innocent blood was poured out so that you and I and any individual in this world could be saved. Is it good enough? Is that act that Jesus did, is it good enough to take away my sin and your sin? Or the sin perhaps of, of someone who has delved into much deeper, darker things than you and I? Is it good enough? The Bible tells us in the ninth chapter in the book of Hebrews, But Christ, being come and high priest of good things to come, by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this building, neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood, he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. And then it goes on to say this. For if the blood of bulls 
and of goats and the ashes of an heifer sprinkling the unclean, <coughs> sanctify it to the purifying of the flesh. So in other words, in the Old Testament, when they, when they offered these innocent animals and placed upon those animals their guilt and their sin, he says, if the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of an heifer sprinkling the unclean sanctifies sanctifieth to the purifying of the flesh, then he poses this question to us. If that worked, if someone in the Old Testament kept the sacrifices in faith, looking to a time that a Savior would come, and it did work, he says, then how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works, to serve the living God. He says, look, he says, if, if these animals, if that worked then, then how much more can Christ bring new life to you and get you away from the dead life that you were once living and take away the guilty conscience that you carry? His blood can do that. I can promise you it can. When we look into the book of 1 Peter, we are told this concerning the blood of Jesus. It says in 1 Peter chapter 1, starting at verse 18, For as much as ye know that ye were not redeemed with corruptible things, as silver and gold, from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers. You know, you here who are saved, this is kind of a twofold message. If you're here and you're saved, I want you to hopefully understand how great this blood is that was given that day. And how, if you still carry with you after being saved a guilty conscience, or if you, after being saved, still carry your past on your shoulders, you need not do that. And the, the other part is, is this, that if you're here and you're lost, you need to understand that this blood that was poured out, this life that was given, that life can save your soul and change your life. It says you were not redeemed with, with corruptible things, the silver and gold, the things in, in this <coughs> life, the, the very best we could possibly think of in this life, those things didn't redeem us. Those things are corruptible. Those things will pass away. They will not last. But he says what we were redeemed with, what we were bought back with, with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. You know, Peter was probably a, a fairly rugged individual, it is believed. He was a fisherman. Uh, he was probably the kind of guy that had rough, calloused hands. And yet here he says that this blood was precious. He uses that word precious. You were redeemed with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. And this was God's plan all along. It was God's plan all along. God's love was so great for the entire world that God had in his mind before everything was ever fashioned that his son would come and pour out his life's blood so that you and I could be saved. So that God's wrath could be satisfied. Amen. It says in the 20th verse, speaking of Jesus, who verily was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you, who by him do believe in God, that raised him up from the dead, and gave him glory that your faith and hope might be in God. It says this was foreordained before the foundation of the world. God knew that you and I would need redeeming. He knew that you and I would need someone innocent to come and stand in our place. What more could you possibly do for someone than to lay down your life for them? There's no greater sacrifice than that, is there? Than to lay down your life for someone. Jesus laid down his life for all because we were guilty and he was innocent. He laid, you know, we, we think of people who we would most freely uh, take a bullet for, so to speak. Our, our wife, or our husband, our children, our, 
moms or dads, but we don't think about those people who are much less desirable. We probably wouldn't take a bullet for them, would we? We probably wouldn't push them out in front of a moving car, would we? We probably wouldn't do those things for the rapist in prison, for the murderer on death row, for the terrorist over in the Middle East. And truth be told, if we met someone exactly like us, and we knew they were just like us, and we could see inside their mind the things that they think, the things that they feel, we probably wouldn't take a bullet for them either. Yeah. But the one who was truly innocent of everything was foreordained before the foundation of the world that he would come and allow his body to be nailed to a cross so that his life's blood could be poured out. So that way, whenever and whoever would come to faith in that gospel message, and God would look down upon them when judgment comes, and God will say, nope, I'm passing over this one. I see the blood upon them. I see the blood upon them. They don't get my wrath. They get my grace. They don't get my judgment. No, they get to live with me forever. Just like the old boy who left his dad's house and he thought, man, I've made a, a huge mistake here. I've squandered my inheritance. I've ruined my father's name by the life that I lived. And I'm not worthy to be called a son anymore. But maybe, just maybe, he will take me in as a hired servant if I beg him. And so he makes his way back home. But probably something unexpected happens. The dad sees him. The Bible says that the father ran and met him and fell upon him and kissed him. And the son began to spout the uh, pre-designed apology that he had, but his dad stopped him and he told the servant, he said, go get the best robe, go get the ring, go get the shoes. My son is home. He was lost and is found. He is, was dead and he is now alive. That is the picture of what we get because of the blood of Jesus. You see, justice is getting what we deserve. What do we all deserve? We all deserve hell. We all deserve judgment. We all deserve wrath. Every single one of us. But because of the blood of Jesus, we can get grace. Mercy and grace. You see, justice is getting what we deserve. Mercy is not getting what we deserve, but grace is getting what we don't deserve. And when the prodigal son came home, he knew he didn't deserve to be a son anymore. He knew he didn't deserve to have the, ro the robe anymore. He knew he didn't deserve to have the ring anymore. He knew that he did not deserve any of that, but grace came his way. The Bible says that he was foreordained before the foundation of the world but was manifest in these last times for you, who by him do believe in God, and the story's not over, that raised him up from the dead. The gospel message is that God gave his son to pour out his life's blood, that he would be buried in a tomb, but he wouldn't stay in that tomb, that he would rise again. Dad, I think I mentioned this in the Sunday school lesson. I'm getting ready to come to a close. If Sister, Sister Mildred would come and pick us out a, a verse of invitation. But there is a lot of vast differences between Christianity and um, all the other so-called religions of the world. Today, Christianity, if, if religion was books... And there was a bookshelf of religions. Christianity would be a book lumped upon that bookshelf with everything else. There's many, many vast differences between Christianity and all the other so-called religions of the world. But one of the biggest differences is this. Buddha is dead and gone. Muhammad is dead and gone. Now we don't know the exact burial site of Jesus. They believe they know. But I can tell you this, of all the burial sites they think he was in, when you go there, he's not in any of them anymore. Because he's alive today. 
And he's alive so that he can save your soul if you will believe in what he did for you. God says, I will smite the land of Egypt, but when I see the blood, I will pass over you. As we stand today.